So my name is Claire Racine. I'm an associate director at JLL. As part of I'm part of their uh, the upstream sustainability team there, um, and I will tell you a little bit. Um, our team we have 40 experts working on all ranges <coughs> range of aspects of sustainability. We're ad providing strategic advice to developers, home builders, investors, and asset managers. Um, we are also the secretariat for the Next Generation benchmark, which is the only sustainability benchmark for UK home building. Every year we assess the top 25 home builders against uh, about 80 criteria covering everything from strategy to delivery and performance. So when I was asked to come and talk to you about quality, the first thing, and of course there'll be overlap with lots that's been covered already, um, the first thing that came to mind for me was Vitruvius. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this guy. <laughs> He's an architect who li lived in, it was ancient Rome, and uh, he wrote a book called the Ten, well, he wrote ten books, the Ten Books of Architecture, which are the only uh, text around architecture that survived from that era and actually got picked up in the Renaissance by uh, everybody who thought it was the greatest. And so he talks about firmness, commodity, and delight as being the aspects of a well-designed building. So I thought I would take that as my lead, being an architect that is close to my heart. Um, and firmness, how can, we, how can we translate those aspects into today's demands? And how is quality evolving in the, in the industry that we work in? The first, for me, that comes as resilience. Firm, firmness translates into resilience. And for, uh, I think there's two aspects of that. One is climate change. We're, we're starting to find, that just as pa Pete was saying, where the, the re there's been a recent report written by the Climate Change Committee that's talking about how we really need to start addressing these issues, that drought, overheating, and flooding are all going to become major issues for people in the UK. And at the same time, we're finding um, the national grid, for the first time since they started measuring the data in 2001, are predicting shortfalls in energy supply this coming winter. So they'll have to bring in emergency uh, expensive power from other places and and that gets people thinking, well, how are we going to handle that as well? So I think both of those things are going to start happening. Perhaps a lot of people are unaware of this because there's not a huge amount of discussion about it, but it will start to be at the forefront of people's mind. And so I think in response to that, just as you were saying, and I was just talking to Martin, there's, they're planning on doing some uh, tests on some of the buildings here. They're going to flood them and see how they respond because I think that will inevitably start coming up the agenda. Also through with insurance, insurance providers will start driving that as well. Um, on the other side, on-site renewables, what we've, we've seen with the success of the Tesla Powerwall, I'm not sure if you've heard about <coughs> this, was um, launched a few years ago, sold out immediately as a way of having renewable energy stored on your, in your garage, basically, mostly aimed at wealthy entrepreneurs in California, I would imagine. But it is, I think, something, what's really interesting now is that Tesla have now become partners with a solar panel provider in the, in the States, and they're looking to increase the sales of their Tesla power pack by 60% above the total sales in the entire industry next year as a result. So we all know there's a, there's a the link between uh, on-site renewables and storage is a critical one that has to be solved in order for that to really be viable, but I think it's already happening in the market. So I think those two, those two things will, will definitely see those affecting the housing market. Um, next, commodity. Well, that one, what came to me for my mind for that was, uh, was around comfort. And th that I associate with things like uh, heating, ventilation, lighting. And of course, those are the most energy consuming systems in the house. And those inevitably result in greenhouse gas emissions. So I think, as we all know, there it's the right thing to do to reduce your energy 
use and your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, other people in the industry, especially housing providers, are looking at it in terms of fuel poverty. How can we address the issues of fuel poverty? And then finally, I think the biggest driver, as we all know, in the industry is regulation around this. So, and sadly, um, for the planet anyway, um, we've got code for sustainable homes scrapped, zero carbon homes removed, and then now with Brexit, all the EU directives that underpin a lot of this sustainability legislation that we uh, all are relying on to, uh, as a bulwark against um, the demands of the market are now in question. So if we look at, and here's a, a kind of messy and overwhelming diagram showing you the EU policies that are driving a lot of the UK legislation. This remains probably the only one that's un not under threat by the Brexit vote, but might be by the current government. We never know what'll happen. So, so I think relying on regulation, as everybody's already said, is probably not the best way of guaranteeing quality in the homes of the UK. Um, but there are, I mean, there are companies who are doing this and embracing it. I'm sure people who are here, I recognize a few of you who are pursuing this way of building that are um, in spite of these uh, trends. So currently we've got compliance through building regs and then the more demanding London plan. But then an example of uh, a passive house, a better best practice I would say are passive house development that's just got planning permission in Norwich. That's a large, one of the largest, it will be the largest UK housing development that's getting passive house certification. So that's really encouraging. And then we also have um, Miles's team, Miles from Lend Lease. They're, they're at, at Elephant and Castle are per participating in the Climate P Positive Program, which is a worldwide initiative that is um, providing a framework for larger regeneration projects to um, be, be climate positive. So they're addressing uh, carbon emissions by reducing demand, doing on-site renewals, and then also improving the greenhouse gas emissions of the fabric of the neighborhoods around them. So that's also a really encouraging trend. Um, so then we get to Delight. Now, Delight is, for me, the place where I think the most, um, there's the most opportunity for improvement and the most opportunity for take up within the market because it really comes down to the customer and the customer feeling good and the customer benefiting. So, and in that way, has a, I think has a lot more traction than, sadly, the, the more philanthropic approach, which doesn't always get people to spend their money. So this to me translates into placemaking and health and well-being. So placemaking, we're really seeing an increased developer awareness of the value add of the holistic approach. And the RICS have actually recently released a study where they've identified a 50% increase in value through delivery on a series of placemaking aspects. And th that to me is really astonishing, but I wouldn't expect the RICS to put their name on something they didn't really believe was true. So that's one aspect of it. And then health and well-being. Well, here what we're finding is a kind of combination of people becoming much more aware of the impact of um, <coughs> the built environment on their personal health. And then at the same time, through things like Fitbits and also air quality monitors that you can have on your phone, they have immediate access to data that, it, that will s actually start to have an impact on how, where they choose to live. So I think these things, similar to climate change and the power supply, that will start to overtake an industry that's not used to being nimble in its response to changes in technology. So I think that's really interesting space to watch, um, especially in light of all the media around, um, for example, air pollution levels in London. 
how we, I don't know, you probably know the figures better than I do, but it's like how we meet our EU maximum within two months of the year. So after that, we're completely blowing it out of the water. So people will, and I know people, of course, in my team, who are actually checking the King's University air quality monitoring program data that's online when they're looking for a place to buy because that they don't want to bring, they're planning on having a young family, they don't want to bring their kids up in a neighborhood that's highly polluted, it's just as simple as that. So I think that will start, we'll st start seeing that happen more widely. Um, so within the placemaking space, all the whole major home builders now have their own system and, and framework for creating places. Barclay Group has focused on social sustainability, so they brought in experts in that field to create a toolkit for them where they can go and talk, like investigate and promote the establishment of community networks. So that, I think, has really helped them. I mean, you could look at it um, as a cynical move, but I don't, I don't, I really don't think it is. And it, and it also, it's benefited the people who are living in their communities. It also helps when they go in for planning for the next. It's a way of establishing a reputation. And if you look into the, the systems that they're using, they're actually very robust. Um, they're based a lot on government um, research in the area using questionnaires that have been well established within the industry. So I, I think it is a very robust and um, a, s a system that improves places for people. Cress Nicholson have adopted a garden village system, which is not a system, but I guess a framework, which is of course based on Ebenezer Howard's garden city model. And so they look at things like the built environment, um, how, I'm not saying the themes properly because I've lost them in all my notes, but it's, <laughs> it's one, one is about how things are built. The other is how people relate to each other, how you can support community networks. And then the final thing is legacy. How do you manage it so that in the long term, everything stays looking like this in, in the long run? Um, and finally, Barrett Homes. Barrett's have been very huge supporters of the Buildings for Life uh, framework, which was developed by CAVE and the National Ho Home Builders Federation. And each of their um, developments is designed to be certified by that system. So that's 12 questions or 12 areas that they need to address that, uh, that are also looking at design and construction, how you promote active lifestyles, and then also how you ensure the management of it is is carried out in a way that sustains the community. So health and well-being, of course I will leave most of the t talk about that to Joe, but I think that's a really interesting area that's just starting. People in the commercial sector have understood the benefits of this for a while now, and certainly at JLL we're seeing a huge uptake in interest in commercial developers and landlords in how they can promote their buildings as being healthy and therefore helping people be more productive because obviously the relationship between your rent and your salaries you pay your staff is there's the salaries, there's the rent. You know, if you pay a bit more in rent and have a nicer building, that'll co be covered easily by the increased productivity of your staff. So that within the residential sector, the link isn't quite as easy. But I think in connection with people having more access to data about themselves and air quality, we'll start to see these things change. So um, what's, what's happening currently, healthy towns, <laughs> uh, as you were talking about and described so well previously. What's interesting for me in this is I, I went to a, a talk by one of the people who's organizing this, and when I asked them, well, what are the metrics you're using? Um, how are you measuring this to show the impact of these things? And they said, well, we're gonna leave that up to the developers, and I thought that was, Shocking, <laughs> not surprising, but also uh, a real opportunity there, I think, to be agreeing somehow a measure of success because so often I think health and well-being can be very considered to be very hand-wavy. Um, you know, we all instinctively <coughs> understand the benefits of it, but can we actually show, well, this percentage of local authority social care spend was 
was saved because everybody knows each other. I, I mean, it's, it's how, how can we establish those things uh, in a way so that we can demonstrate progress and compare them, compare the results. So that for me, an opportunity. We've got this lovely report of Joe's that she'll talk about, which I think is, as you were saying, really helpful, very useful set of uh, a framework for looking at this complex issue. The well standard, a huge take up of that in the UK over the last year. It's almost become a nuclear arms race between agencies, from what I can see, who's got the most well APs. And it's not an easy exam. I've taken it. It's really, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, the BRIAM equivalent for health and well-being. Really, really hard and very technical. Um, and I think <laughs> we'll start seeing well standard being taken up, certainly in the commercial se sector. It's already started and they're doing uh, residential trials. I mean, they have a prototype uh, version for well, so that'll start. Com we'll start seeing that <coughs> soon, I think. Especially in the PRS sector, in the private rental sector, where you're going to start having a lot of people entering the industry who are competing for um, people. They, they want to establish a reputation as a good landlord, providing good service. They've also got people behind them, investors who want these things to last a long time. The well standard will be, uh, I think, start to be something that they see as a way of indicating to the market that this is a quality product. Um, also very interesting, British Land have in integrated wellness into their sustainability strategy as a, an actual aim for them to uh, an, an aspect that they want to have in all of their developments. So I think that's quite a, an interesting um, adaptation of that right into the heart of actually a, quite a commercial operation. And they're also starting to look at non-financial metrics to report in their annual report. So, the, so I can see that developers and landlords and home builders are seeing the ben will see, recognize the benefits of promoting health and well-being because they can attract customers, they can retain tenants, they can enhance their brand and their reputation, and then they start to address risks of obsolescence at the same time. So, so I believe that these. Um, qualities of resilience, comfort, and placemaking and health and well-being driven by climate change regulation and this increased access to data will result in resilient, resilient low carbon and healthy homes. Um, but I'm very interested to hear what people in the room are doing on, along these lines and, and what you think of my predictions. <laughs>